Good morning. So if you haven't seen Back to the Future, you've been hiding under a rock, but uh, you can come out. It plays every three days on TBS. Uh, but uh, that movie is about um, boundaries. And uh, when he doesn't have boundaries, when you're watching that thing, all you can think is, why is he not standing up to Biff, right? You're thinking, why is his dad not saying, you wrecked my car or something else? Because we look at that and we understand that that's not right. And yet, in our own lives so often, we don't notice when we don't have boundaries. And there's there's two main problems that happen with our idea of boundaries. A lot of us grew up in homes where we were not allowed to say no. And if you grew up in a home that uh, either for whatever reason they forced you to say yes to everything, like they told you don't talk to strangers, and then when a stranger came over your house, they said talk to a stranger, uh, and don't you disrespect me, and that kind of thing. What happens sometimes if we grew up in a house that's that way is we don't develop a good no. The other thing is if we grew up in a permissive home, what happens is that we think that there are no boundaries. And so we don't, we don't know a whole lot of those people, but there are a few that we know who violate everyone else's boundary. I'm going to give you a statement today that I want you to remember. You have to say no to the wrong choice to say yes to God's voice. Now, Robert knows me pretty well as far as construction goes, and Robert and I have talked about painting. So, Robert, let me ask you a question first. Robert, do you trust me? He says, yes, he trusts me. Robert, would you let me come and do drywall in your house? You would. You're crazy. As bad as my painting is, let me tell you something about my drywall ability. It's worse. So let me ask you again, now that you know my painting ability, would you allow me to come and spackle at your house? No, no. So here's the thing. You can trust some people in certain areas and some people in others. The difficulty today is we sometimes trust the wrong people with the wrong part of our life. See, we look at Samson today. Samson is a hero of the Bible. And the reason I do that is because uh, Samson's probably the most flawed hero in the Bible. He's up there in the top five of flawed heroes. He, um, to me, I feel sorry for him, honestly. Um, and I'll show you that as we go through this. But I want you today, when we look at this idea of boundaries, to realize, okay, you trust some people for some things and some people for other things. God gives us choices, and sometimes in order to say yes to what God wants, we have to say no to these other things, and we have to be careful about people. You ever know somebody who makes trouble everywhere they go? Like, everywhere they go, it's like a Tasmanian devil. Uh, that was Samson. Everywhere he went, he caused trouble. So let's look today at three things uh, that will help you to have better relationships as far as boundary. Number one, don't trust the untrustworthy. Don't trust the untrustworthy. So before we get into Judges, we're going to start in uh, chapter 14. By the way, you can read this whole story. I would encourage you to read this whole story, and you will read it, and you'll go, what? He did what? And you'll be like, oh, that was awesome. He did that. He did what? And so that's kind of Samson's life. And so um, Samson um, decides he wants to marry a Philistine woman. And he tells his dad, and it's like, his dad's like, uh, you, can't you marry somebody else? And he's like, nope, that's what I want. Obviously, permissive home, right? And so he goes, and they tell him, hey, you got to have 30 groomsmen. Samson apparently has no friends because he now has 30 Philistine groomsmen. People he does not know at all are now considered his best friend. This word that they use in here is the idea of... Uh, uh, a friendship. These are his friends. That's the way they use it. And uh, so what happens is he wants to earn respect. So what does he do? He does what guys do a lot of times. He makes a bet. And he says, I'm going to give you a riddle. And if you can answer it, I'll give you 30 articles of clothing. But if you, you can't answer it, then I get 30 articles of clothing, clothing. And they said, that's a good bet. So then those 30 guys who are his friends went to his brand new wife and they said these words. If you don't find out the answer to our riddle, we're going to kill your entire family. So this is where we pick up the story. Doesn't this sound like a very healthy, lots of healthy relationships going on here. And we pick up the story and 
his wife basically comes to him and goes, give me the answer to the riddle. And he's like, no. And then it continues in Judges 14, 16 to 18. Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing. You hate me. Doesn't that sound like a three-year-old? Have you heard that? You hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the riddle. Or me the answer. Now, I think at this point, Samson's trying to give a little bit of a boundary here. Listen to what he says next. He says, I haven't even explained it to my father or mother. By the way, never compare your wife to your father or mother. Like, I wouldn't even do that for them. Well, you're really in trouble now, right? Okay, so anyway, sorry, that's a side point. So why should I explain it to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her, why? Because she continued to press him. She in turn explained the riddle to her people. Before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, what's sweeter than honey, what is stronger than a lion? And they gave him the answer. Samson said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. By the way, he's making lots of husbandry mistakes comparing his wife to a heifer was one of them. Now, here's the thing you also realize. His new wife knew how strong he was, had heard how amazing he was, and yet she feared those people and didn't feel like she could be honest with her own husband. It kind of shows you the depth of their relationship. And then he calls her a cow on their uh, 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 wedding party. Nice. So after this, just to tell you what a neat guy he was, he says, oh, she told my riddle, uh, one of the groomsmen, you can have her. And then later he wants her back and ends up getting her whole family killed anyway. Just a wonderful guy. He goes and gets the 30 things of clothing by killing a bunch of people. So how did all this come about? Samson could not say no. Samson followed his desires over and over and over. And so what happens is Samson said yes to everything that his senses said was good. So the next thing you know, he's with a prostitute. And the next thing you know, he's with this woman, Delilah. And I'm going to let Steve pick up. But let me show you a few things, a few practical things from this story. Beware of people who use praise and then shame. You don't love me. Watch out for comparisons. By the way, they both did that. I mean, when he says, I haven't even told my parents. That's, you know, don't. If you have that conversation with your spouse, you are in. Come see me. All right. Emotion driven. Emotion. Do you allow emotion to carry you? By the way, when we allow emotion to carry us, there's actually been studies that your rational part of your brain turns off. So why does the news want to get you angry or scared? Because then the, then the rational part of your brain turns off. Why do politicians want to do that? Okay, keep going. Can't keep a secret. Beware of people who can't keep a secret. And so if somebody comes, you, comes to you and tells you secrets of other people, can I tell you something? You need to put in your mind, oh no. Be careful what you tell them. Because they're telling you what somebody else said, and guess what? You're next. Now look for people who have acceptance for you. Now, that doesn't mean you're perfect, because as you get close to people, you discover they're not perfect. You can accept somebody, and you should get close enough to people that you, every once in a while, go, oh, no. You should get close enough to people that you go, once in a while. By the way, if you're listening on the podcast, I made a face of, oh, no. Acceptance, individuality, you accept people for people. If you're a parent, listen, don't try to make your kids into your image. Ask God, God, show me how to help my kids be all you have for them. Help them to have healthy boundaries. And Lord, the only way I can do that is help them be who God has made them to be. Conviction driven. Conviction says, I know what's right, I know what's wrong. I base that on scripture, not on my own understanding, not on what I think is good or bad, not what society says, not what a politician says, not what one of my buddies says. I have convictions. And then finally, are you trustworthy? Right away, the reason that Samson had so, much, so many problems is he had nobody to do this for him. He had to have 30 foreign groomsmen help him. If just one of those guys was his friend, they would have said, hey, watch out. These guys threatened your wife. 
But nobody cared enough about him, and he did not learn good boundaries. Steve's going to share the second part of this message. So would you welcome Pastor Steve to the stage here. Good morning, everybody. Maybe I'm on. Can you hear me? Everybody can hear me? Okay, wonderful. Well, you'll have to just give me a little grace here because I'm not so fluent in having my computer here and my notes and everything. But holy smokes, looking for love in all the wrong places. Is this not like, could put that like in air, air quotes for around Samson, right? He's been making one mistake after another. You know, it's often said that when God is repeating a message in the Bible, we ought to pay special attention to it. And an example is perfectly clear what we're seeing today, and that is a message about boundaries. If boundaries were not important, I don't suppose we would have so many examples laced throughout Scripture about the importance of it. And I would ask a question, where might we see our first example of boundaries in Scripture? Think about that. Where do you think you might find that? If you go way back to the beginning, we find it in Genesis, don't we? Now, of course, we could look at Genesis 1 and 2 and say, oh, there's certainly, I mean, we're looking at creation. There's some boundaries there, aren't there? However, I'm talking more about the fall in the garden where, where Satan comes in and he, um, you know, causes the fall of Adam and Eve. And, and if they had had better boundaries... This would probably be a much different world, wouldn't it? Satan pursued their weakness. He manipulated and convinced them of a falsehood. He lured them to trust him and his lies. And ultimately, the encounter led in the betrayal that we all suffer from today. That passage alerts us to the importance that we must, must, must... We must safeguard our weaknesses and seek fellowship with those who are trustworthy, transparent, and not self-centered. We are to seek fellowship with those who are honest and not deceitful. Those who are spiritually uplifting and encouraging and not manipulating for their own self-gain. We should seek others who are, in fact, trustworthy and who are committed to us to serve and help protect us. Just as scripture tells us, iron sharpens iron. We must always remember, friends, what was Satan's goal back in the garden, right? He wanted to destroy what was precious to God. Every single one of us is precious to God. We know Satan prowls like a lion seeking to devour we must have our boundaries and stick to them and maintain them. There's many examples of boundaries throughout Scripture. And when maintained, good things often happen. Scripture describes it over and over again. In contrast, when they're not maintained, when you kind of tweak them around or find some soft edges that you try to work around, very often not good things will happen as a result. Well, I'm going to continue now in Judges. And, um, and the record of Samson and Delilah that we see, and again, we see the importance of, of, of good boundaries and what happens when we don't have them. Because in this case, what we see with Samson is that he's toying with Delilah. He's already teased her. He sees her charade, and she's asking him about, gee, how do we find your weakness? And he goes first, like, oh, with bowstrings. Tie me up with bowstrings, and that'll work. And she does that. That doesn't work, right? So as we pick up from that example, he continues in this flirting with danger. So we pick up at uh, verse 10, 16, verse 10 in Judges. Then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. 
Delilah then said to Samson, all this time you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with the pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. Now, time out just a second here. What's he doing here? He's teasing and toying, but he's leading her to what he believes the truth is, that his strength is like it's about his hair. As we know, in hindsight, it's not his hair at all. It's the presence of the will of God, the strength of God that's in him. That's his strength. And we'll find out more about that a little further downstream. And so he goes and I continue. So I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric and tightened it with the pin. Again, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled the pin from the loom with the fabric. Now, this example of warning of others with uh, self-centered focus is pretty clear. However, how do we apply this to us today? This passage demonstrates that we are to be aware of the danger of self-centered others. Beware of those who point out your short shortcomings harmfully and try to leverage that against you. Beware of those who try to manipulate you. And friends, we all have those people in or around us, don't we? Beware of those who give you that crocodile smile of trust. And of course, beware of those that betray others. Because what goes around comes around. If they're betraying others, talking bad about others, they'll do the same to you. Just a matter of time. In contrast, look for others who are transparent. Who come with honest and noble intentions and requests. Who offer sincere commitment and trust. And those who are loyal and protecting with you and of you and for you. And not manipulating you to their betterment. And that leads us up to point three. Recognizing the danger of manipulation. And this is where I lateral back off to Pastor Rear. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Steve. We were glad to hear from you today and um, as we encourage our folks to continue to step up. By the way, I want to say something real quick. So every once in a while, I'll have somebody, because I've got a video helping me to teach a class I'm doing, and they say, well, Pastor, why aren't you just teaching it all? Because you need to recognize that other people bring other perspectives to God's Word. It's one of the reasons that I love for different folks to share. If you only listen or only value the opinion or the teaching of one pastor from God's Word, you really need to say, God, would you give me a, a little opening to hear different people who share God's Word? Even in the Bible, uh, they heard different speakers, and they all fell asleep when Paul shared one time. That's how boring he was, just so you know. Somebody actually fell asleep during church, fell out the window, and died during church. And that hasn't happened to me yet. <laughs> yet. All right. So let's recognize the danger of manipulation. I want to remind you, you have to say no to the wrong choice to say yes to God's voice. Now, listen, this is important that you teach, especially if you have children or grandchildren. This is huge. Because there are always people who, to make themselves feel better, will try to get your children or even you to do things you don't want to do. And initially, you say no, and they'll just keep pressing until you go into it. Let me give you a, a really silly example. I used to ride roller coasters as a kid. I went to Carowinds years ago, and there was nobody in the park, and I rode roller coasters as a young teenager till I was sick. It was an awesome day. When I got into college, I quit enjoying roller coasters. I just did not enjoy them anymore. I would ride them, and I remember thinking, this is just not fun for me. And we went to a place called Boardwalk and Baseball. Does anybody remember Boardwalk and Baseball? That's a long time ago. I've shown my age and your age at the same time. I think there's a housing development there now. It's at 27 and I-4. And, uh, but Boardwalk and Baseball, um, that's where they had spring training, but they also had a, a little theme park with a couple of roller coasters. And I did not want to go on the roller coasters. I was a, in my first year of college, and I just said, I don't want to go. I wasn't feeling good that day. 
And I remember one of the guys I was with basically said, come on, man, what are you, chicken? Come on, go. And I was like McFly, right? What are you, chicken, right? Right? And so I got on the roller coaster, and I literally the whole time remembered thinking, this is miserable. I will never again say yes to a ride I don't want to go on. Now, my wife can testify to you today that that is absolutely true. We will go to a theme park, we'll go to Disney World, and she'll say, I want to go on that ride, and I go, have a great time, see you when you get off. And I have the best time just waiting. She's like, but you're missing the fun. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm missing the miserableness. Have a good time. So I say, how did it go? Oh, it was great, had a good time. A lot of times she says, oh, it's just not that much of a ride. And when she says that, I think, I'm going to look that up and see if I can ride that one. That sounds... Mine train? Yeah, I can do mine train. All right. Goofy roller coaster, that's the top, top of my limit right there. Goofy roller coaster. Pirates of the Caribbean, eh, it depends on the day. Don't like the drop, right? Weirdo. So what happened? I got to the point of being manipulated by somebody that I said, no more. In your life, there's going to be people who try to get you to do things that you don't feel right doing, and you'll only do it out of guilt and shame, not out of God's best for you. Be careful of that because what will happen is if you give in to that, you not only will say no to the bad things, because you've been hurt, you will say no to the good things. And there are people who will no longer serve in church, no longer help other people, no longer do things that God wants them to do because at one point they let themselves be manipulated and gave in to shame and guilt and now they say no to everything. So let's read what happens next. So Samson has the member of the Philistine wife and the prostitute. He meets Delilah and he keeps toying with her. And finally, he gives in to sin. By the way, two types of sin. Sin done to you and sin uh, that you do. And Samson had both here. Here's what he says. When Delilah saw that he told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more. He's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistine returned with silver in their hands. They manipulated her too, right? After putting him to sleep on her lap, talk about manipulation, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him. By the way, it wasn't his hair that gave him power. It was God who gave him power, and yet he had to be obedient to God to have that power. And that's what happened as his hair grew back. The reason he regained his strength is he was being obedient again. The Philistines are upon you. He woke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know what happened. The Lord left him, not just his hair. The Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding grain in the prison. And we see that and we think, what a fool Samson was. I mean, that dude had all the strength in the world, and yet he kept allowing people who didn't care about him to manipulate him. Don't we all know somebody who's fallen into a struggle because they got around the wrong people? Don't we all know somebody who, because of who they hung out with, they're no longer with us? Don't we know somebody, I don't know if you do, I grew up in Miami, so I know people who went to jail as accomplices because somebody talked them in to going and committing a felony with them and they were just present at the felony and spent time in jail. We look at Samson and think how foolish and yet, how many times have we given in to somebody manipulating us? Maybe to the point that no longer do we say yes to the good. So we're just as dead as Samson was, except that now we just don't feel guilty about it because we just don't say yes to anything anymore. What does God want you to say no to so that you can say yes? And the truth is, if you said yes to something in the past when you weren't supposed to, don't let that keep you from saying yes today to what God has for you. Let me show you. Things to be aware of. Beware of people who use your words against you. They, they use it to manipulate you. They use it to try to get you to do what they want. They attack you. They pretend to care, but they actually hurt you. 
Beware of people who reveal your weaknesses. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins, which means that if you really love somebody and you really get to know them, by the way, happens to me all the time. People get to know me. They come to my small group. The first week, they're like, oh, he's amazing. The third week, they go, who let him be pastor? So love does what? Covers weakness. Doesn't mean that we don't call out when people are sinning or, or aggravating or attacking other people. But it means that we understand that we're all flawed and we all, like the Bible says, struggle in many ways. Look for people who use words to bless you. By the way, if you want to know what a good friend is, listen to how somebody talks about someone else when they're not with them. If they're positive to their face and then say to you, I can't believe, blah, blah, blah. Don't you think that they're not going to do that to you when they leave? Beware of those people. Look for people who defend you. Look for people who care and heal you and cover your weakness. Delilah was the opposite of all these things. And Samson trusted her. He trusted the wrong people. He trusted a manipulator. And it was not the first time. And he never learned his lesson. Listen, if you don't have good boundaries... You won't be able to say no to the wrong choices. And you definitely won't hear the yes for what God wants you to do. I want you to be able to say yes to God's voice. But you can only do that when you say no to the other choice. I remember years ago when I was in college or just out of college, I was an intern at a church or I was, excuse me, I was a youth pastor at a church and I had an intern and this intern had been in the party lifestyle. And one day he said to me, Hey, Eric, I've got some friends that are begging me to go to a party. And I know if I go, I'm going to struggle with drinking because that was my past. And I need to kind of get away from that and get away from those friends so that I don't struggle. And I said to him, so what do you need to do? He said, I need to say, I'm not going to the party. I said, that's right. And so he made the choice to say no to those friends because he knew if he said yes to those friends, he'd be pulled right back in. And because of that, he continued to grow. And he's in ministry today as a counselor. And it's awesome to see him growing and changing and God using him. But I wonder years ago if he had said yes to those manipulative friends, those self-centered friends, if he had given in to them, where would he be today? Listen, God wants to use you. God wants to use you to bless others, but you've got to say no to the wrong things. If you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus, I want to encourage you. The Bible says in John 3, 16, that God loved the world so much that he sent Jesus to die for us. Why? Because we're messed up and broken. We can't pay for our own sin. But Jesus came to pay for it. So if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to him, if you've never said, Jesus, I'm tired of going my own way, walking in sin, saying yes to everything the world has and saying no to you, God, instead, I want to say no to the world and I want to say yes to you. If you want to surrender your life to Christ today so that he can come into your life, he'll change you from the inside out. He'll change your habits, your desires. He changes who you are through his Holy Spirit. If you want to do that today, I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what that means. If you're watching online, you can send me an email. I'd love to talk to you about being a Christian. Maybe you're here today, and as I spoke and I talked about saying yes and no, you went, oh, no. That's okay. You know what repentance is? Repentance is saying, God, you're right. I've been wrong. Forgive me, and I'm going to do what's right. So say yes to those choices God has for you. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time together. Lord, thank you for examples in the Bible and non-examples in the Bible Father, people who followed you through difficulty and others who had all the gifts in the world and yet said yes to the wrong things. May we be those who say yes to you. Father, I pray for those here today who maybe don't know you, that today would be the day they say no to the world and say yes to you. I pray also for those who've said yes to some things they shouldn't, that today they would begin by starting to set boundaries to say no. To not live out of guilt and shame, but to live out of righteousness and conviction. Lord, we say yes to you this morning. We thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a great